Welcome back. Uh, in this segment, I'm going to discuss the stresses in two different applications that are important in design. Uh, the first one is going to be about uh, stress concentration due to uh, discontinuities or uh, disturbances in the material in the form of holes or uh, disruptions in the cross section. Obviously, if we have uh, discontinuities in the material, uh, the forces have to be taken up by the rest of the material. So uh, in this case, uh, the material, the stress in the remaining sections of the material can be elevated to a degree that can cause failure. Uh, the second area that I'll, I'm going to discuss is the design of uh, pressure vessels and uh, tubes. And the difference is that the pressure vessel is uh, thick, it has a thick wall, and the tube has a thin wall. So we will do both of them and get a couple of applications. So let's look at the idea of stress concentrations first. So here <coughs> we uh, uh, have a material that uh, we will take a very simple example of a, a plate and the plate uh, is under tensile forces uh, so it has a width uh, w let's say and a thickness t and uh, it has a, a remote uh, force on it uh, in this fashion so that remote force is distributed on the two edges <coughs> and uh, now let's assume that we have a hole in the center here and the hole is through the material. So in this case, uh, the material, the remaining section is going to be smaller at the mid part of the, of the plate. <clears throat> so if I want to uh, look at a very simple idea of how the forces uh, transferred in the material, I look at the force density, which is uh, basically the uh, connection between the arrows from one end to the other. So the force density is going to have to avoid the hole from the center because the hole cannot carry any load. And in fact, right at the center, uh, the flow of force is going to be uh, in this fashion. And therefore, we would expect some crowding of these force lines around the hole. So if we look at the crowding, the crowding is right here and right there. And uh, if we just simply look at the stress as the force intensity, which means that uh, if you think of these lines as uh, force lines, then if you count the number of lines per unit area, that can give you an idea about the stress. So from this simple mental picture, <coughs> we would conclude that just in the vicinity of the hole, <coughs> especially in this location here and this location, the stress is going to be, the remote stress is going to be amplified. So if we define uh, a nominal stress and the word nominal means in name, which means far away, uh, as uh, equal to the applied force, the total applied force, divided by, so I have an applied force F and F here. If I divide it by the remaining area of the material that can take the stress, and that will be, uh, instead of W, I have to subtract uh, the diameter of the hole which is D, and uh, multiply it by T. So that stress is sigma zero. In the vicinity of the hole, the uh, stress is going to be amplified. <coughs> so in this case, sigma max <coughs> will be an amplification of sigma zero. And this amplification factor is known as a stress intensity factor. Stress intensity factor. And uh, in uh, theory courses, we set up 
a boundary value problem and uh, solve for the stress distribution everywhere in the material and then determine the maximum stress in the vicinity of the hole. So this type of exercise has been done uh, many years ago and uh, the results of finding the maximum stress uh, usually analytically uh, all of these results were obtained um, maybe three to four decades back and the results are tabulated now for designers to use so let's see what we have here so as we mentioned um, there's a, a theoretical a stress concentration factor and uh, we can consider uh, a, uh, an axial uh, stress tra uh, tra concentration factor uh, for tension and uh, we also can consider a shear type concentration factor and uh, as we defined it is the ratio of the maximum to the nominal stress so if you look uh, in Shigley's book there is uh, there are tables and the tables uh, in uh, in, in Appendix A15 uh, and A16, it shows us the results of many of these calculations for the stress intensity factor. So if you look at here, uh, this is exactly the same example I was showing. And the area now is the reduced area, W minus D times T. And then you see on this axis here is the stress concentration factor for tension. And uh, on this axis here is the ratio of the diameter to the width of the uh, tension uh, specimen. And uh, it is uh, clear now uh, that the this stress concentration factor um, decreases as the hole becomes smaller and smaller in relationship uh, to the uh, width of the, uh, of the material. So this is D over, over W. And um, as the diameter, uh, the D over W uh, decreases, then uh, the stress concentration factor increases. It is interesting because you might think that the stress concentration becomes higher and higher as the diameter uh, of the hole increases. But <clears throat> what happens is that the stress crowding becomes less in larger holes in smaller holes, the dispersion, the disturbance is so severe, so you get more stress crowding, and therefore you get higher stress concentration factor. Uh, what we need to understand is that if the hole is small, then the nominal stress itself uh, is is smaller because the disturbance is not taking away much of uh, the uh, cross section. So. Uh, there is there are two issues here one is the influence of the disturbance on the nominal stress sigma zero as the size of the disturbance increases uh, the nominal stress uh, will inc will will increase because you're eating away from the material and the other factor is that uh, as the disturbance size becomes bigger uh, the stress concentration factor itself is reduced uh, so we have to consider both of them in the design. The, uh, this figure here shows uh, shaft under bending, as in power transmission in our case. So a bending moment, and we have uh, the shaft has a discontinuity, but the discontinuity is filleted with the radius R, and the diameter of a small shaft is lowercase d, and the larger shaft is uh, uppercase d. And uh, the stress concentration factor is the appropriate one for bending and it's a function of the fillet radius in relationship to the small diameter r over d again it decreases as r over d increases so it's a more generous fillet would be a good idea and then this is also a function of the jump from lowercase d to capital d which is this ratio as the ratio of the law of the discontinuity increases, then you will get higher uh, stress concentration factors. Uh, so, how, what do we do uh, when we have stress concentration factors? Generally, uh, 
uh, the highest stress fibers yield first and then the load is shared with the next fibers and then you the the actually the plasticity is local close to the fillet uh, or the disturbance so if we have a static loading and a ductile material uh, what happens is that the uh, plasticity will kind of smooth out the effect of the stress concentration. If we have a dynamic loading or a brittle material, then it's a very dangerous situation that we have to worry about. So let's see in, in real design the techniques to reduce the stress concentration for shafting in power transmission. We have a small diameter shaft and a larger one. We have several techniques we can increase the shaft radius to reduce the stress, uh, which is more material, more dollars, reduce the disruption. So the, uh, the disruption, which means the ratio of the two diameters, we uh, make sure that it is not very large. And uh, uh, then we can shape the dead, the dead zone here between the small shaft and larger shaft so that we can allow for very smooth transition of the lines of force without excessive crowding so we have a general generous shoulder relief groove in that case uh, very close to the bearings I mean, for instance in this case we have roller bearings on the smaller shaft and therefore we would reduce the stress concentration factor here so let's take an example in this example we have a um, a bar <clears throat> that's two millimeter thick and it's loaded axially so it's a steel bar with the force is 10 kilonewton and uh, then it is heat treated quench to raise the strength so it's high strength but it lost ductility so in this case uh, once it loses ductility then it raises a flag that we have to uh, actually worry about the stress concentration factor it means that the lower the ductility, the more concerned we are about stress concentration. So that's the case. And in this example, we're going to drill a hole and uh, we can select the diameter of the hole to uh, put here uh, to, uh, to pass a cable through it. <clears throat> so um, if we had the situation that we wanted to study is that <clears throat> we have Number one, we have a fillet here that has one millimeter radius. Number two, we have a hole uh, that is four millimeter. And uh, however, uh, if we have a drill that is readily available that can drill eight millimeter hole, we wanted to, to look to see if we can go ahead and do this eight millimeter uh, drilling. <coughs> so in this case, <coughs> we have three different possibilities to consider. Is the crack going to be here? or is it going to be in the small hole or in the larger hole. So we have to look at the, this, the, the actual stress at this location and in this location. And as I mentioned, the actual, actual stress is a product of two things. The nominal stress, so we have to look at the area, uh, times the stress concentration factor, which we'll get it from uh, the appendices. So in this case, we have the nominal stress in the first case. Uh, the material is brittle. This is F over the remaining section area, uh, which is 40 minus 4, because we consider a small hole. Uh, that gives us nominal stress 139 MPA. So we go to uh, figure A15-1 and uh, look at the, the curve for uh, uh, the diameter d over w equals 0.1 we find e uh, the, if we go 0.1 we find the k as equal to 2.7 and therefore the maximum stress will be 2.7 139 will be 380 mpa we do the same <coughs> for the larger hole the stress is going to be higher from 139 to 156 but the stress concentration factor is going to be lower from 2.7 to 2.5 so the net result is the maximum stress is 390 as compared to 380 so it went up for the larger hole <coughs> now the third situation to consider 
is the fillet and uh, we have another table a 155 or a graph figure and it shows us for r over d d a capital d over lowercase d is 1.18 so we consider something close to that one and uh, r over d is 0 0.026 um, then we find 0 0.026 is right here then we will find just on the regular edge the k sub t is about two and a half so in this range here and therefore the maximum <coughs> stress is 368 so we now compare three numbers 368 versus 390 versus 380 so it means that the larger hole is the one that's going to cause us the headaches and the problems and then the uh, fillet is not going to cause a problem or if you have a smaller hole that w could be also uh, a good uh, design solution okay so now uh, this is basically the idea for stress concentration factors and you have the tables and the graphs in the book for any design problem we can go back and uh, uh, find the stress concentration factor and uh, invoke this in the design process uh, I have to mention that this is not fraction mechanics this is just a disturbance with um, a generous radius of curvature so it's not a very sharp crack and it must be taken into account uh, when you have machining and manufacturing of the components um, later in the course we're going to look at fraction mechanics and the effects of cracks on uh, the design process now the next uh, topic that i would like to cover which is different from uh, finding stress concentration factors is the topic of pressurized cylinders and tubes and uh, the difference that in terminology is that the cylinder has a thick <coughs> wall and the tube has a thin wall how can we tell thick versus thin well any cylinder has an average radius so if we take the ratio of the wall thickness and divide it by the average ra radius and if that ratio is less than one tenth then we can consider this a tube otherwise we'll consider it a cylinder that has a high pressure so that's kind of the situation that we are considering so let's uh, look here at uh, stresses in uh, pressurized uh, cylinders and uh, tubes so what i would uh, like to do is uh, discuss uh, just uh, what happens if you have a cylinder and uh, uh, that is very thin so it's basically a tube so in the case of a tube if we take a tube that has an inner radius uh, r sub i and the thickness t the wall thickness t and an outer radius r sub o and then it is long and uh, it is uh, fil filled with a uh, a gas or a fluid that has a pressure P and uh, in this case if, if we have if the cylinder is closed from that end here and uh, we took a cut in here somewhere then the cut uh, is going to look like the bottom so I'm going to kind of remove what I did here and consider the bottom of the cylinder to be the cut and we're going to show the force equilibrium this cut so if I go inside uh, the tube uh, then I will find an element and an element here will have uh, two types of stresses one in the tangential direction and one in the uh, z direction or longitudinal direction so in essence we have sigma theta and sigma z and uh, sigma uh, theta is uh, the hoop stress that is called the hoop stress uh, or the tangential stress sigma t and sigma z is called the axial stress or the longitudinal stress and we're going to call it sigma l so what happens is that if i cut on the bottom 
then there's going to be the pressure is causing a force that is acting in here and this force has to be reacted by the uh, the, uh, the longitudinal stress sigma L so sigma L times the area that is acting on which is 2, two pi r let me write it as pi times d and I'm going to take an average value of d between the inner and outer times the thickness t so this is the area and uh, on this side here we have the force is equal to the pressure times the cross-sectional area that is acting on so theoretically speaking the cross-sectional area is pi times d in squared over four so if i look at this i would say that for force equilibrium i have p times pi <coughs> d in squared over four is equal to sigma z average like an average value of sigma z times um, d in times or if i take now an average value of the diameter in the in this case so i'll have the average times t and from that um, this is pi here because this is a perimeter so from that we can find a value for uh, the longitudinal or the uh, stress in the axial direction there's no problem so if you look at here in this equation we have two diameters one inner one one average and in reality there's a kind of a stress distribution between the inner and the outer fibers of the uh, tube then for design purposes we try to be conservative and we use kind of uh, the inner uh, value in this sense that we can calculate the stress so sigma z or sigma l so the sigma z is the same as sigma l and uh, this we can um, take it as the maximum value so this is now the maximum i went from this expression to the maximum value as p times di plus the thickness divided by 2t um, so uh, if you have here uh, the um, uh, the axial this I, by 40 I'm sorry about that so it's 40 so this will be 4 times t and uh, that will be uh, an expression that we could use uh, to determine uh, the stress that is in the z direction similarly we can write an expression for the stress in the tangential in the tangential direction sigma t and again we're going to use the max just for safety and that will be p times di plus t over 2t so in other words if you compare these two expressions uh, that you see a very simple result that the uh, tangential stress is twice as much as the longitudinal stress so usually that's the hope in the hope direction you get a lot of tension as compared to the axial direction if the tube is closed so if we have to pressurize the tube it's going to burst basically by opening up in the hope direction rather than by splitting uh, axially which is uh, kind of a common observation so that's kind of the situation for a thin walled uh, uh, cylinder or tube and uh, we obtain the results by simple equilibrium in reality when we use elasticity we find uh, expressions for the longitudinal and the uh, hoop stresses uh, using uh, a solution of a boundary value problem and satisfying the boundary conditions and we come up with expressions for the radial and the uh, radial stress and if we have a thick cylinder uh, 
we would have a radial stress and we would have an axial stress and we would have also a hoop stress. So three principal stresses uh, in a pressurized cylinder. Uh, we wouldn't expect to have any shear because there's no twisting and no out of uh, symmetry kind of stresses. And therefore we just have three principal stresses that we could use to gauge um, uh, the uh, ability, the material uh, problems in, in terms of failure criterion, as we'll see in the future. So let's look at this situation now. I'm not going to derive any. I'll show you the results, and we will use these results in uh, design applications. So <clears throat> if we have here, look at uh, results for um, the tangential and radial stresses uh, for a pressurized cylinder. This is the most general expression where the cylinder has an <coughs> internal pressure PI, uh, external pressure PO. So PO is opposing PI. And um, we uh, have uh, the tangential stress is given by this expression, 349, and the radial stress is given by this expression. So in case most of the time, we don't have an external pressure although we will use that in another application in the next lecture. But let's assume that for a pressurized cylinder that the outside pressure is zero. So in this case, the results of these general expressions will become much simpler, although we will have a pressurized cylinder, but the results will be simpler, and we can use them for either thick or thin uh, applications as follows. So if you look here, you see that in the case of PO equals zero, the tangential stress is uh, Ri squared times the pressure divided by uh, the difference between the squares of the radii. And then you have an amplification factor, one plus. And the radial, the same, but you have kind of a reduction factor, one minus. So if you plot these two equations as a function of R, the tangential, it starts from the outside to be small. And then as, it, as you go closer and closer to the edge, so on the inner uh, uh, fibers, the stress becomes very high because you add one plus RO over RI. So the, 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 the amplification factor at this point is one plus RO over RI square. So if the ratio is uh, between them is, uh, is large, RO over RI is large, then you get a lot of amplification. Uh, on the other hand, the radial stress, uh, it has to satisfy the boundary condition from both ends. On this end, the pressure is zero, and the radial stress has to resist that pressure. Since the pressure is zero, then the radial stress must be zero, as you can see here. And on the inside, uh, the radial stress must also resist or equilibrate the internal pressure. So sigma radio will be negative because compressive, and so the arrows are going down in this way, and uh, it, it is negative and its maximum value is equal to uh, minus the PI. So these are kind of the conclusions we have for uh, the uh, uh, pressurized cylinder. And if the ends are closed, then the longitudinal stress also exists. And from simple force equilibrium, just like we did for the tube, then you get a more general expression for a thick cylinder uh, that is PI RI squared over RO squared minus RI squared. So we've done now our job, and uh, I wanted to take an example uh, to illustrate how we can calculate uh, stress distributions in pressurized cylinders. So in this example, we have an aluminum alloy pressure vessel, and it's made of tubing having an outer diameter of eight inches and a wall thickness of a quarter. And uh, we are asked to uh, determine the pressure that the cylinder can carry if the permissible tangential stress is 12k psi. And then we want to use the theory of thin walls uh, vessels. Then number B, we want to use 
the theory of thick walled cylinders, and then compare. So for A, we have to find the inner diameter, which is the outer minus two times the thickness, seven and a half. Inner radius is half of that, 3.75. Outer radius is four. So the thickness divided by the radius is 0.25 divided by 3.75 is 0 0.067, less than one tenth. So theory of thin wall should work. So in this case, we solve uh, the equation finding the using the equation for the maximum uh, for the maximum uh, stress. So this equation is right here. So sigma longitudinal maximum is equal to p times di plus c over 4t. And this is the this is the tangential. So if we use the tangential, p max will be 2t times sigma t here max divided by di plus ti and that's what i have here so you get 774 uh, psi so it's a little bit less than one ksi for that aluminum cylinder uh, so now i can move on to uh, the requirement b and the requirement b is that assume that i have 774 psi what is the corresponding maximum tangential stress as we mentioned before, the maximum tangential stress is going to be uh, right at the inner radius. So I have to take this expression and put R to be Ri in this expression. So having done that, then I have Ri squared here, and it gives me 12 KSI, which is very close or exactly almost the same as the 12 KSI that we started with for the thin walled um, tube approximation. And finally, the radial stress, we can also uh, use the equation to say that the radial stress is maximized at the inner radius and is equal to the negative PI because compression is equal to minus 774, which is again very, very close to the thin wall approximation. So from this example, we see that we can either use the thick wall or a thin wall, and there's no matter, it doesn't matter. But in general, if we have a thick pressure vessel, we have to uh, find uh, three, type, three stresses, uh, one radial, one tangential, one long longitudinal, and then we uh, can use a failure theory in the future by ordering these stresses as principal stresses and finding failure criteria. So we have a little bit more advantages if we employ the uh, uh, thick pressure vessel uh, approximation. Uh, so next, uh, we have one or two more uh, short segments to um, talk about additional uh, stress uh, evaluation problems for design uh, before we move on to the next.